Jason Kidd forces his way out of Brooklyn after asking for control of the entire organization. What do we make of this? Let's go to Dallas with Mike Fisher, DallasBasketball.com, and 105.3 The Fan. He has covered Jason Kidd uh, during his time down in, in Dallas. And Mike, just right off the bat, does this surprise you? Well, it doesn't surprise me that Jason Kidd fights his way through normal etiquette <laughs> and normal <laughs> rules. That part's not surprising. Of course, I've known him since he came to Dallas in 1994, and I, I like him and admire him uh, because of his, his will to win. But this, this power play kind of violates etiquette. Uh, and, in fact, I don't think this is so much uh, uh, about Jason Kidd wanting to take over the Nets I think it's about Jason Kidd pretty cleverly finding a way to escape the Nets. No, based on the the talent that's on that roster, yeah, it's an older roster, but clearly you've got an owner who's willing to spend tons of money. What makes Milwaukee so much more attractive to Jason Kidd than New Jersey? Or, yeah, I I'm think sorry, it's about York. Buck's new ownership and the fact that Kidd, when he was a player late in his career, he would in the off season go and intern on Wall Street. And, and at the time, it seemed like a – Seemed like an odd thing for a for a wealthy basketball player who never graduated from college to bother doing. I mean, what are you doing on Wall Street? Well, what he was doing was making acquaintances with the kind of people who just became the owner of the Bucks. <laughs> and so, <laughs> what what kid wants to do? It's not about who's on the roster or the the flash in the city. It's it's about having a place where he can accumulate power and exercise his vision. And he's going to be able to do that in Milwaukee because one of his close Wall Street friends will be the only guy between him and the top of the ceiling in Milwaukee. So you don't think this was a, a, like a blown-up negotiation where he went in and asked for too much? He, you think this was his intent the entire time? In large part because his request is uh, his request in New Jersey for a salary change is absurd. Uh, when, when you create a partnership with your coach – and you give him the authority that kid did have. Look at how it works in any other city, in Carlisle in Dallas. He he can't come in every week, every time somebody else gets a raise, and say and say I want to get a raise too. Uh, that, that's a, that's an absurd request that undermines everything that an organization is trying to do and creates a cancer inside that organization. And kid knows that. What happens when the Nets give kid a raise to five million dollars because Derek Fisher just got that? And then next week, uh, the Lakers hire a coach, and they give him 5.1. Does Kidd get to go back in and get another raise? Jason Kidd knows that an organization can't give him that. That's why I think this was a power play out, not a power play up. So, And, and we're talking here with Mike Fisher, Sarman and LeVac, 104.5 The Team, ESPN Radio, Mike Fisher of DallasBasketball.com, and 105.3 The Fan. Do you see this as, you know, we, Jason Kidd has a reputation of being a coach killer or a guy who who wants it his way and wants to just through sheer force of of will bend everyone else around him to what he wants. Do you see this as part of that reputation, or is this maybe is that reputation even misguided a little bit, or, or how, how do you view it? Yeah, and I and I like Jason Kidd, but that reputation is deserved. One of the reasons I like him is because he, when he came back to Dallas the second time around, he folded in to what Rick Carlisle wanted him to do and what Mark Cuban asked him to do. At least he did for the short term and helped him win the championship. And they don't even come close to sniffing a title if not for Jason Kidd's leadership. But even here, at the end, it went sour. The Mavericks sent Jason Kidd, as I'm sure you guys will recall, to New York to recruit Darren Williams to come here. And instead, Darren Williams came close to recruiting Jason Kidd to going there. And Kidd did indeed go to the city, uh, across the bridge, obviously, instead of coming to Dallas. And that created bitterness, of course, between Cuban and Kidd, who, who Cuban thought they were, they were partners in this deal. And Jason Kidd will eventually, I think, get his banner raised, get his jersey raised in the American Airlines Center in Dallas. But, but, uh, that, that betrayal, if you will, certainly delays that concept. The, the plan two years ago was that kid would sign a two-year contract in Dallas, finish his career here, be a hero here for all time, get his jersey raised to the banners, and then 
work his way into being an assistant general manager, working under Cuban, under Donnie Nelson, and alongside a guy named Keith Grant, who's a longtime assistant GM here, and learn the trade. And Jason Kidd has skipped all those steps, and now, of course, is basically going to be the king of Wisconsin. Well, so, like around the league, the way the the coaches, the university, the, the all the coaches together, all the owners together, the way that Jason Kidd has done this, where uh, where Larry Drew has been ousted, he just kind of moved his way over there. Is is this going to be well regarded by the other coaches, or is he pretty much done in this league? Yeah, well, and it's not done because what exactly are the ramifications of other guys not liking you? Uh, what 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 happens? Does it mean? That, that nobody will make a trade with the Bucks. No, it doesn't really mean that. That nobody will schedule preseason games with the Bucks. No, it doesn't mean that. So I don't know that there are real ramifications, but I I can certainly tell you, you know, Rick Carlisle will never say anything bad about Jason Kidd, but Carlisle is the president of the Coaches Association and feels obliged to protect people like Larry Drew, uh, who, who is obviously getting hosed here. And I'm sure behind the scenes, people like Rick Carlisle, who've been doing this the right way for so long, are shaking their heads at Jason Kidd, Jason Kidd having done this in a wrong way, in a way that that uh, does kind of bastardize the connection in the fraternity of coaches. 104.5, the team, Armin and Levac here. Joe Bianchino filling in for Armin Williams, and we're talking to Mike Fisher of DallasBasketball.com, 105.3, the fan. L- let me ask you this, because I at least have been kicking around this idea that the Nets right now are better off because right now they're going to get two second-round draft picks and they're going to go out and get to sign a coach like Lionel Hollins or Mark Jackson, or George Carl. They all got good, solid, enti- known entities in the NBA right now that are out there for them to go get as a head coach. Am, am I am I wrong? Am, am I missing something on Jason Kidd as a coach versus what I'm seeing right now, which is Jason Kidd, the cancer, and who they can bring in uh, in, in his stead? Well, you're right in this sense. It, it, uh, you're always better off without a guy who doesn't want to be there. If if your wife doesn't want to be married to you, you're better off without her. But the original <laughs> plan here was that Prokhorov and his money and his power and his influence and his charm was going to cause Brooklyn to have their new stadium and all the shiny new toys and new uniforms. And Jason Kidd was going to be an institution here. And we're going to create a, di- a, a dining room. Well, none, none of that's happened. Not not one bit of that's happened. Kid and the Nets did obviously turn it around to the point where they had a playoff berth this year. But the organization is a long way from being a model organization. You even hear rumors that Prokhorov now, seeing that a team like the Clippers is worth $2 billion, he may turn around and, and cash his in. So what it does is make you appreciate franchises that are able to somehow stay the course and keep the people uh, in the organization up top bonded and keep key players bonded. It's a difficult thing to pull off. I think we're seeing Miami on the verge of pulling it off. The Celtics obviously have done those things for years. And as a Dallas guy, I think it makes you appreciate the Cuban-Carlisle connection all the more, not to mention Dirk Nowitzki, who's also part of this management team in a sense. All right, Fish. Now, we wouldn't be the home for New York sports if I don't ask you this question. We've uh, we've heard D Rose says he's not going to help recruit Mello in Chicago. Uh, we know that Mavericks are one of the visits that Mello is going to make. What kind of red car- carpet's going to be rolled out for him? And do you think uh, he ends up as, as a Dallas Maverick? Well, I've always put these things every year at at one percent, and <laughs> and uh, I'm not suggesting you take me completely literally there. But Carmelo Anthony visits Wednesday here. The Mavericks have a chance. I, I hear a lot of people saying you know, there's only four teams, so they have a one in four chance. That's 25. percent That's obviously not how it works. Uh, Phoenix can all of a sudden be another team, and the Lakers can be another team. Last year, remember with Dwight Howard, it was it was the Lakers and Houston and Dallas, and suddenly Golden State finished in the top three, and they didn't even have cap room to do it. So. There are 30 teams who want to get their hands on Carmelo Anthony, and that lessens the odds. Not not lower than 1% for Dallas, but let's keep it at 1%, shall we? Mike Fisher, DallasBasketball.com and 105.3 The Fan. Thanks so much for your time. All right, man. Thanks.